praise your name. I praise your name. Most high and awesome God. Most high and awesome God. And lift my hands. And lift my hands. Unto you. Unto you. You save my soul. You save my soul. On a rugged tree. On a rugged tree. Now I praise you. Now I praise you. And serve you, Lord, throughout eternity. When in your life have you been waiting on some news and it finally came? Have you had those experiences? I guess the one that stands out to me, at least right now, is when I was waiting on the news about whether or not I had been accepted into graduate school. So this was some decades ago now. But I remember receiving that email. I remember where I was and you know what computer I was on at the time, checking my email. And yes, I, it was already the point where email was the way to receive such news. Uh, the, that, that had just come along. And... I received that email, and the, the reason that stands out to me is, of course, because it was a life-changing bit of news. It really affected where my life was going to go from that point on. I have received other bits of good news, oftentimes over email, but they're not usually life-changing. They're nice or they're bad, but usually it's not that big of a deal. But that's one I remember being a life-changing email to receive, and it was after having received some uh, similar emails that were not so positive. Uh, we are not going to let you come study here, buddy. Uh, you're not good enough for us. I, I got some of those emails also. So when I got the email that said, we'll, we'll, we'll let you come study with us, that was a bit of good news. I, I will always remember getting that email. Do you have similar experiences, maybe over email. It, honestly, it's a sign of my own pampered, comfortable life that that's the best thing I can come up with. There are people in the world and people in the history of the world that can come up with a lot better stories about receiving some good news that is life-changing. Israel in the book of Isaiah, could come up with a lot better story than I could about receiving some news that is life-changing. And Isaiah talks about that in Isaiah chapter 52, and he gives us this famous, what is to us, I think, a famous account of this good news in verse 7. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of of the messenger who announces peace, who brings good news, who announces salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. The messenger is coming to Israel to announce peace, to bring salvation. This same idea is also found actually in another prophet, uh, Nahum. If you look at chapter 1, verse 15 of Nahum, it's almost the same phrasing. Beautiful feet, announcing peace. So perhaps this was something that just people talked about, about a messenger bringing good news, and, and that messenger had beautiful feet. In the, in the book of Nahum, it's not talking about the same kind of a message that, that Isaiah is talking about. In the book of Nahum, the message would be about the destruction of Nineveh, the, the capital of the Assyrian Empire. But that was good news for the people of Judah because Assyria, Nineveh, was the threat at the time. And so if they were no longer a threat, that's good news. In the book of Isaiah... In this section of the book of Isaiah, we are in the time, the, at least the scene, what Isaiah is talking about is the 
end of exile. That's clear all the way back in chapter 40. Comfort, oh comfort, my, my people speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Because she's paid double for all her sins. How has she paid double for all her sins? Because she has endured exile. Remember, uh, we've talked about this before. At the end of chapter 48, I think it's verse 20. Go out from Babylon, flee from Chaldea. It's pretty clear that Isaiah is talking about the end of the exile. And in chapter 52, verse 7, this messenger that has the beautiful feet who is going to come announce salvation, what that salvation looks like is, well, in Nahum, it was the destruction of Assyria. In Isaiah 52, verse 7, it's the destruction of Babylon. When Cyrus the Persian king overtook the Babylonian empire and it's Cyrus, Ezra chapter one, it is Cyrus who releases the Jews from captivity and says, y'all can go home. You can go back to your homeland. You can rebuild your temple. You can get back to your lives there. You don't have to stay here in Babylon anymore. And the messenger in Isaiah 52 verse seven it's coming to announce salvation, coming to announce that Babylon is no more, that the captivity is over. When I got that email about graduate school, that was a life-changing email, but it wasn't anywhere close to the good news about the end of the exile, about the captivity being over, about you can go back to your homeland after generations here in Babylon. There are people still today who are longing for that kind of news. We see refugee crises too often in the media. People longing for peace and salvation and that's what Israel is receiving here from this messenger with the beautiful feet. This messenger says, your God reigns. In verse 8, listen, you, your sentinels lift up their voices. Together they sing for joy. For in plain sight, they see the return of the Lord to Zion. God According to other prophets, I'm not sure that this is in Isaiah so much, but in other prophets, we read about actually God abandoning Zion, Jerusalem, the temple, leaving. Oh, one famous passage is Jeremiah chapter 7, which is Jeremiah's temple sermon, where, where the, the people had been... Uh, the people of, of Israel, this is before the exile. This is while Babylonians were out there and, and the people of Judah were thinking, well, they're not going to destroy us because our temple is here and, and the Lord won't allow it to happen. He loves it when we worship him in this temple. And so they would say they would have this chant, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. As long as the temple is here, the, Jerusalem cannot be destroyed. And God is telling the people through the his mouthpiece, Jeremiah, that is not right. I do not like it when you worship me after you have committed some crimes. I do not like it when you worship me with impure hearts. That is not something I am a fan of. If you think that your worship of me with all those uh, crimes on your hands is what is keeping me in Jerusalem, you have another thing coming. This place is going to be destroyed just like Shiloh, my previous sanctuary, was destroyed. That's what God says in Jeremiah 7. He is abandoning the temple. He is abandoning Jerusalem. We see the same thing, even more explicitly, really, a, a vision in Ezekiel. If you go to Ezekiel chapters 8 through 11, you see that the, the prophet, who is himself an exile, Ezekiel is living in Babylon, having been taken captive by the Babylonians, but in a vision, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. In a vision, Ezekiel is transported to Jerusalem in chapters 8 through 11. And he sees people in the temple in Jerusalem worshiping foreign gods. 
And God is basically telling Ezekiel, this is why I'm going to destroy this place. And we see, Ezekiel sees, God in the form of the glory of the Lord sitting on the Ark of the Covenant. Remember, the Ark of the Covenant exists in the temple as the throne or footstool of God. And that Ark, spiritually, symbolically, gets up out of the temple and goes and dwells on a mountain. That's what Ezekiel tells us in Ezekiel eleven twenty two. Then the cherubim lifted up their wings with the wheels beside them, and the glory of the God of Israel was above them, and the glory of the Lord ascended from the middle of the city, that's the city of Jerusalem, and stopped on the mountain east of the city. And so God is no longer going to live, according to Ezekiel, God is no longer going to live in the temple. God has abandoned the temple. God has abandoned Jerusalem. And he is going to go uh, on a mountain somewhere and oversee the destruction of Jerusalem. God has abandoned Jerusalem. But the, the beautiful sentinel with those beautiful feet is coming to announce that that is no longer the case in Isaiah 52 verse 8. The Lord is returning to Zion. Salvation has come. Peace has come. And if we can imagine, if we can remember times in our lives when we have received some good news from, from some messenger with the beautiful feet, and I guess that email would have had to have the beautiful feet in my case. If we can imagine that, so also even more so, we can imagine the, the wonderful salvation that Israel experienced, the message that they received. But Isaiah 52, 7 is famous to us, not so much because Isaiah said it, I think, but more so because Paul said it in Romans 10. Listen to, I'll start reading in verse 14. How are they to call on one in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in one whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone to proclaim him? And how are they to proclaim him unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. And in Romans 10, 15, the good news is no longer about the destruction of Babylon or the release of the Judeans from captivity and the ability to return to their homeland. It's no longer that good news. In fact, I think Paul would say that was that's small potatoes compared to the good news. Just as my own good news that I've tried to relate to you would be, I would admit, small potatoes next to the good news of the end of the captivity in Isaiah 52, 7. I think Paul would say, well, that good news, the end of the captivity itself, is small potatoes next to the more profound end of a more profound captivity that we can now announce the good news of the salvation that we have in Jesus Christ. How beautiful are the feet of the messengers who announce that good news. If the messengers had the beautiful feet who announced the end of captivity, much more now. The good news of God in Jesus Christ should be welcomed by everyone because their spiritual captivity has now come to an end. I praise your name, I praise your name most, high and awesome God, most high and awesome God, and let my hands, and let my hands turn to you. Unto you, you save my soul. You save my soul on a rugged tree. On a rugged tree. Now I praise you. Now I praise you and serve you, Lord, throughout eternity.